Welcome, Hoosier fans, to this week's edition of Assembly Call Radio, where each week we discuss the most interesting topics in the world of Indiana basketball. This is our 166th edition of Assembly Call Radio, and it is our 617th episode overall of the Assembly Call, recorded on the evening of Thursday, April 23rd, 2020. I am your host, Andy Bottoms, and let's begin this edition of the Assembly Call how we begin every edition of the Assembly Call, and that is with our Hoosier Proud Banner moment. And... Uh, for me, there really wasn't a lot of IU news uh, at all this week, as would be evidence if, if people had access to our discussion of what we were going to cover on tonight's show. We did get a little bit of IU news today that we'll hit later, but uh, instead of focusing on something IU related, uh, I wanted to just focus on some other good things that are going on. I think uh, these in these times, it's easy to focus a lot on things that aren't going well and the frustration that comes from not being able to do the things that we all would like to be able to do, who have become accustomed to be able to do. And uh, like all of us, we have our good days and, and bad here and there. Uh, and this week's had a couple of long days for us here between schoolwork and uh, cancellation of school and just different things going on. So I figured good time as any to focus on a few good things that have uh, kind of cropped up either on my social media or other things lately. Uh, the first of which kind of in my own house. Um, there's a lot of stuff that different educators are doing right now. I'm sure coach could attest to this and be able to try to do things differently, reach students differently, just check up on students that they haven't heard from. And so as I sit upstairs and work, I can hear my wife downstairs uh, recording herself to try to teach lessons. She's taught herself so much new technology in the last couple of weeks, uh, probably more than she ever thought she'd need to, to be able to, to teach her kids. And then this week she started having smaller groups in her, uh, in her Google meet sessions with them. And it's just awesome to hear her excitement to be able to see them. There was a couple this week that she really hadn't heard much from. And just to hear her get excited and the kids be excited to, to hear from her. Some of them wanted to read her a book. Some of them wanted her to read them a book. Um, some of them wanted to basically take her on a tour of their house, just different stuff like that. And um, it's one example, but a lot of educators are doing the same thing. And I'm proud of her and proud of everybody else who's trying to make this work as best they can when there's no playbook for how to actually do it. Um, the second one is our, our friends at home field. Uh, for those who uh, we've obviously had a, a longstanding relationship with them and are proud to do so. Uh, but Connor, uh, they, they came out this week. Uh, for those who are college football fans who uh, go to the Banner Society site, um, they're a, a, a really fun college football site. And uh, they had a, a group of folks who were furloughed for three months. So Connor, in less than a week, uh, has put up a couple of shirts and raised, I think at last count, over $35,000 that they'll be able to provide to those folks uh, who are doing that. So just yet another reason uh, why we're all proud to be associated with the fine folks at Home Field. And uh, kudos to Connor for jumping on that, doing it quickly, and to uh, any of our listeners who supported that. Uh, thanks to you as well. And then uh, today on uh, Facebook, I had a story come across from uh, Matt Blaska, uh, who I know is a, a listener and um, does some stuff with Crimson Cast as well. Uh, it was basically a story about a nurse named Brooke Morris from Indianapolis. She basically volunteered to go. She's a traveling nurse, volunteered to go to New York for eight weeks to help out. Um, you know, kind of cool, cool story. Uh, I think it was on CBS four in Indianapolis and basically talked to her about why she felt compelled to do it and what she'd seen so far. And, um, for somebody who's in probably in a lot of negativity there, like her attitude, uh, that came through was really, really good and, and seems to be someone who, has a, a fair amount of a religious background. And so they asked her if she had a favorite phrase or Bible verse that she was living by. And she responded with be the light. Uh, so I thought those were good kind of words to live by. And uh, hopefully things that we can all keep in mind during this time when we don't have IU basketball and it's not easy to find uh, banner moments. Uh, you don't have to look too hard to find some other banner moments going around about people doing uh, really selfless things and helping out. And it's one of those things that uh, make difficult times seem a little bit better um, because you can be reminded so much of, of the good things that are out there and not the things that are frustrating or uh, not the way that we would like. So I'll give that as my banner moment this week. We'll come back and we'll figure out an IU related one for next week. But for now, uh, a few examples, I'm sure everybody has those. So thank the people that you see that are going out and doing something above and beyond uh, to go out and help other people. So with that, I will introduce my esteemed co-host for this week's show. Jared is off tonight, as is probably obvious based on the facts that I'm hosting. Um, the potential is that for him to scour Cameo for the third time to see if any new IU players are on there. Uh, maybe it's somebody with a nice accent. Maybe hearing Tijon say Gerard would be exciting, but who knows? Uh, Ryan is covering the NFL draft for the big lead, so make sure you follow along with his coverage of that. But here with me to my left is the coach, Brian Tonsoni, and one of the few drops that I do have 
is uh, Coach's intro. So we'll play that now. He remembers the days when a movie cost a dollar. Heaven help you if you ever decide to pop your collar. Play hard, but remember, fake hustle is a crime. He's the coach and it's on Sony time. Coach, welcome tonight, and uh, how you doing? What's on your mind this evening? Well, a really good um, opening segment, Andy. Kudos. We have a bunch of people in the IU um, family doing great things. You know, Buffalo is ser- serving food. Uh, Joel and his wife, um, Julie, getting Indiana gear and Purdue, uh, unfortunately, Purdue gear out. But it's good uh, masks and hats for our, our frontline workers. Um, and, 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 again, to home field and, and everyone who's – probably donated things chad sent out something about youth sports today um you know to 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 look to help and so uh one of the nice things about our community and this group of friends that we have supporting indiana hoosiers is our outreach and everything is to be um commended uh that way thinking a lot about uh player movement uh from transfers to well we have the nfl draft going on right now for you football fans and, and players are getting to um, pursue their dreams. And I will. I just have to remind myself and, and maybe uh, listeners out there as well that, you know, players make choices to come to programs for a lot of different reasons, and they choose to leave programs for a lot of uh, reasons. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. We could have opinions on that. Uh, but ultimately, I, I tend to try to respect the decision. I, I, I have no problem with the, with the young man wanting to pursue something that's a little different than what they've had. I don't mind uh, something like what we're going to talk about later with Demisey, you know, after two years figuring out that um, things just weren't going in a, in a direction. And then there's, you know, no anger. Uh, appreciate Demisey giving Indiana a chance, uh, appreciating Demisey and the coaching staff being honest and having a real tough conversation that coaches have to have sometimes with players about their role and then uh, honor, honor those decisions. Uh, I, I'd rather – a young man make a decision like Demisey than than some of these guys that that transfer out, uh, you know, graduate transfers and stuff, trying to to boost their own uh, stock or or whatever. I, I think this was a real difficult decision. We'll talk about it a lot more in detail, but um, I think people have the right to go where they want to go, and, and then they have a right to change their mind. I think that's part of what what makes our country great. And in in this virus time, um, I'm going to applaud the young man and thank him and. Uh, and we move on, but there's recruiting news and everything. So now's the time in this off season. It's going to look a lot different, but let's keep up to date on as much as we possibly can. And and it it's generally works its it works itself out over time. And to my right, straight out of the chat mob, is our own Chad, aka General Chadwick Schwartzkoff. Chad, what are your opening thoughts on the last week in IU basketball, or anything else you've got on your mind tonight? Yeah, just chiming in, continuing on with what uh, Coach said, he kind of teased. Uh, I had shared on my Twitter, and you can look me up uh, at General Chadwick on Twitter, a petition that's going around to kind of bring more attention and awareness to uh, youth sports out there. It's kind of something that's really struggling, as as well as a lot of small businesses are right now, because a lot of these uh, youth sports, sports athletes, uh, uh, training facilities, uh, gymnastics, cheerleading, uh, soccer, basketball, all those types of things, um, aren't going on right now. And uh, there is still rent that's being due. Lenders are still asking for rent. They still have to, they're still trying, a lot of them are still trying to pay, pay their employees, uh, doing a lot of things like that. So I, I shared earlier a petition and I'll share it again so uh, people can find it to try to sign to just bring awareness to that and uh, uh, more attention. And at, as well as there's a lot of businesses that are struggling. Uh, the best thing to do uh, in this is know that we will, we will all come out uh in the end, we will come out better and we'll come out stronger. And um, it's also kind of allowed a lot of us to uh, uh, connect to people that maybe we haven't connected to for a long time. Uh, just this weekend, uh, Zoom has become an incredible piece of uh, software that a lot of us have used uh, both through our schooling and everything. But I challenge you to do kind of what I'm doing this weekend and uh, connect with some people you haven't seen or talked to in a while. Uh, Set up a little hangout uh, to hang out with them. I'm going to meet up with some old high school buddies uh, tomorrow night. uh, And then uh, another night I'm going to be hanging out with some uh, uh, some old college buddies. So it's really fun to be able to reconnect uh, with people I haven't seen in years and talked to in years. And um, while it is tough to be inside and be bottled up. It's at least uh, always try to look on the bright side, find something to make you laugh and make you smile. And uh, we'll all get through this. 
Yep, absolutely. I have found that since we use Zoom for the show, I've at least been well prepared when I have to get my kids signed on for things for uh, their, you mentioned youth sports, they've both been doing, uh, their soccer coach has been having them do some training stuff at home. So uh, at least the show has well prepared me to do that. Um, I also say that as somebody who forgot to uh, go live with the right streaming thing when I interviewed Mike DeCorsi earlier in the week for uh, for Banner Monday. So maybe I haven't learned that much. Anyway, uh, what we're going to talk about this week, uh, we do have a few college basketball headlines. Again, things are a little sparse. Uh, main topic of the show tonight will be, uh, as Coach talked about, the, the news of Demise and. Anderson entering the transfer portal, and then we'll hit your questions as usual uh, coming up this week on Assembly Call Radio. Before we get to all that, a few quick announcements. Uh, I mentioned them off the top, but uh, please continue to support our friends at Home Field. You can go to homefieldapparel.com and use the promo code ASSEMBLY20 to get 20% off your entire purchase. Uh, I talked about what Connor's doing for the the folks at Banner Society, um, but Connor has also really stepped up to do the right thing by his employees as well, uh, and has uh, you know posted about that on their site. So if you've, uh, I know they're working through orders because they're trying to maintain social distancing and not having as many people in the shop and uh, all those kinds of things. So I know I've seen him out talking to you know thanking people for their patience and things like that. But it's well worth the wait. Uh, very comfortable stuff. I've worn uh, worn their stuff a few times this week while working from home. So. Uh, super comfortable. So I encourage you to go out there and uh, check out everything they've got. Uh, and then if you want to support a local food bank, those are obviously places who are being uh, taxed pretty heavily, both with schools being out and with people um, losing jobs, being furloughed, different things like that. Um, the strain on on some of the food banks and food pantries uh, is is a, is a real struggle uh, out there. So if you want to look up a local food pantry in your area, you can go to foodpantries.org. That way, if you want, if there's one that you want to support locally, uh, you can do that. Or you can go to feedingamerica.org as a more uh, national organization that will uh, will get the funds where they need to go. So, if you're looking to do something, uh, do something good, be the light, as we talked about. Those are a couple ways to do it. There are a lot of other ways, so do that however you see fit. But we uh, appreciate anything that you're doing out there for uh, either any of the folks that we've mentioned or uh, something that you found in your area. So, all right, few headlines uh, here. Um, it says Hoosier headlines, but this one is not really a Hoosier headline other than maybe Hoosiers are glad to see him gone. Uh, Matt Harms today uh, picked BYU. He was down to BYU, Kentucky, and Texas Tech. Um, and and I, I know I've seen a few quotes from him seem like uh, he maybe wanted to be, I don't, I don't want to say a focal point because I don't think it'll be a focal point at, at, of the offense at BYU, but I think um, maybe wanted to get a place where he could play a little more prominent role that led to him um, going to BYU. Coach, any any thoughts on that as the final destination um, for him in that sequence or anything that you took away from some of the quotes that he, uh, that he mentioned in the aftermath of making that decision? Yeah, I, I think this one was a surprise to a lot of people, including those people at Purdue. Um, I think it just happened somewhat quickly, uh, from what I've gathered uh, from people around here, because uh, I live close to to West Lafayette. But it does seem like it is. He has been told that for his future, he needs to go and, and fill a different role than what he would have been sharing time uh, with T- T- Travion Williams or whatever that guy's name is, a post player uh, coming off the bench. At, at, you know, but there's still some competition at BYU um, for that. There would have been at the other two destinations that that he chose. Uh, I'm not sure this is a, a long-term great decision. Uh, sometimes young people make um, some tough decisions. I understand graduate transfers from smaller division schools, smaller mid-majors that have a chance to go play at a bigger school and pursuing that. I, I have I have no issues. Um, with that, and I don't have issues mostly with graduate transfers. If you just run your course, you've done your coursework, you've graduated out of school and moved on. Um, th- this one seems to be, you know, all, all of a sudden two weeks. So I hope he made the right decision for himself. And I will say this I've had the opportunity to be in the media room a few times up at Purdue with Delphi Bracketology. And, and, and Matt is an outstanding spokesperson. He speaks well, he's a great teammate. Uh, despite what we think about him on the court, and we don't like him, so I have a little love hate relationship. So I'm not I'm not real sad to see him leave the Big Ten um, as a basketball player for the team that I don't like to root for. Uh, but he is a pretty solid individual uh, and has been impressive in person when you talk to him. So I hope he made the right decision, didn't make a rash decision. But I think it definitely impacts Purdue a little bit. They, they won't be as deep, so that's probably good news for for our fans. Yeah, Chad, thoughts on. Uh thoughts any farewells that you want to you want to say to harms here i don't know it, it gave me shivers down my spine uh, hearing coach talk some positives about him but oh, i feel better now um 
Yeah, I mean, it, he'll he'll do well there. I mean, they're a very boisterous, crazy uh, fan base, uh, very similar to what you run into when you're over there at and playing in at Purdue. Uh, so they'll get used, he'll get used to that and he'll, they'll love his energy. They'll love his enthusiasm, his emotion and all that. And, um, farewell. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I think when you looked at some of the other options, um, you know, Kentucky certainly has a need based on how many guys are gone, but I think the option for him, you know, the West coast conference is a far less physical league than what he'd be going up against inside against the sec and the West coast conference. And that likely is the best thing, uh, for him. So I, I can see how that would influence the decision, but I, uh, you know, I, maybe I would have thought about Texas tech if, if I was him just with what they do defensively, I think he'd be a pretty good fit for what, uh, Chris Beard likes to do, but, uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, other, a couple other things, um, Jared had this list on here as Bob Knight called it. They had a clip of him in the last dance talking about Michael Jordan being the greatest basketball player he'd ever seen. Uh, and that was in 1984 in the Olympics before uh, actually playing a game uh, in the NBA. So uh, not sure if you, if you guys had thoughts on, on that uh, chat, I'll throw this to you first, that, or uh, just any initial impressions of the last dance, if you've watched it. Uh, I'm about halfway through the first, the first episode. It's, it's cool to see. And, and being someone that I, I work in production and everything and to have that gold mind of footage sitting around for so long to only now be used um, is amazing. Um, and it's pretty incredible the access they were given and uh, everything like that. Uh, I had the benefit of living in Charlotte and uh, I have actually, since again, I work in production, I have worked with him before and it is true the way you hear a lot of people talk about him and say that he doesn't feel like he is a real man. And, um, there's a few people, as the document says, that, that have that status or had that status when he started. It was Babe Ruth that was uh, and Muhammad Ali, and then he came in. And I would argue Tiger Woods is kind of all along that same line where they just uh, extend past um, being a normal person and, and almost don't seem real, seem, seem fictitious. Uh, but it is cool to have uh, Bobby Knight in there. Uh, that great clip, even if you haven't seen uh, the last dance episode yet to you, oh, you've all probably seen that, that Bobby Knight clip. It's been shared a lot uh, since the last dance started, but um, yeah, it's, it, it's cool to see that recognition uh, for IU in there. And um, I can't wait to see the rest of the series. Coach, about you? Well, I, I grew up in the Chicagoland area. I, I saw Jordan play 30, 30, 40 times in old stadium in United stadium in the playoffs uh, out of the playoffs when he was a rookie. And it, it brings back a lot of positive memories of, of some of the guys that I used to hang out with and make trips into Chicago, but I'll turn it to an Indiana thing. One, um, the thing that Knight and Jordan have in, in common is, is that mental toughness that I'm going to kick your rear end attitude. And, uh, the thing I will say is that sometimes that turns people off because people see your heroes and that you want them to be all nice and, uh, 24 hours a day, you're going to see Jordan not being nice. And, and, and the reason Jordan's not going to be nice is because he doesn't want anyone messing around. He has goals. He has goals of winning. And when you, you're on Jordan's team, you're going to get the wrath of Jordan. When your best player is your hardest worker, he's going to rip people in practice. Now he's going to rip Jerry Krause. And, and, and so I've seen a lot of talk about how they, they didn't treat Jerry Krause right. When you have a championship person, they're not going to be nice. Now, that doesn't excuse what Bob Knight ended up doing to get in trouble. And sometimes your greatest strength is your greatest weakness. It gets you in, in trouble a little bit. But you have to be nasty to be a top-notch uh, program. You have, you have to have a level of just borderline, you know, not break the rules, not being too dirty. But you got to just go home go out and you're going to see that in this documentary and that ultimately is what we all want here at indiana we want that kind of program where we're just going to knock you in the mouth and then we're going to knock you in the mouth again and then we're going to stand over you and we're going to talk about it. we're not going to pop the collar we're not going to fake hustle but we're going to talk to you a little bit uh, while we're going down the floor and, and we're going to bark at you in practice and in the locker room if you're not playing well i expect someone in that indiana locker room to get into someone and not be nice um and that player led a player-led program, whether it's professional college or high school, is much better than a coach-led program because the locker room's taken care of. And you will see Jordan takes care of his locker room. Uh, I love the Olympic thing when they beat up Tony Kukoc. You're going to come play for the Bulls. Pippen and I are going to beat you up, and you're going to know who the boss is. I mean, that's the way that's, – that's competition at its best. And you're going to see that in this 10-part documentary. So that's a little bit about the Bulls, but it's a little bit about where we need to take the Indiana program uh, and have that chip back on our shoulder. Where you come into Assembly Hall, you're going to go out limping. 
Yeah, it was funny. I, I thought of you during watching the show just about, you know, we, we joke with you about how much you say toughness about different guys and things like that. But boy, yeah, just watching, you know, some of that footage, and even Jordan came out in, in the beginning, you know, before it even aired and it's like, people are going to not think, may not think highly of me after some of the stuff that comes out. I think you've heard a lot of those stories. This puts a little bit of video to it, but man, just even some of those, some of the parts they've already shown where he was just getting on guys, just could not stand to lose. Didn't understand why anybody else would be able to tolerate losing in, in any way, shape or form. And, um, so it's been a, it's been a fun watch so far, uh, for me. And then, uh, other quick one, uh, the Hoosier hysterics guys teased that they had interviewed Archie Miller this week. So definitely curious to see, uh, what, what, uh, how that went and and if he opens up a little bit on there I think that's one of the things he's been pretty guarded I think in a in a lot of ways um, and I think that's part of his personality I think it's part of the gig uh, being the head coach so I'm really curious to hear that when it comes out um, just as as to uh, you know what they talk about and uh, what they can you know what kind of stuff they can pull out of him so it should be a fun one to listen to I've been catching up on some of their other uh, recent ones while I've been uh, working here at the house so We'll look forward to that in the coming weeks. Uh, but with that, we'll uh, we'll go to break. And uh, coming up, we're going to analyze the news of the day, which is Demise Anderson announcing his intention to transfer from Indiana. What does that mean for IU, and what does it mean for Demise? We'll break it all down next. Stick with us. This is Jordan Halls, and I never miss a shot or an episode of The Assembly Call. And welcome back to The Assembly Call. You can find all of our content at our website, assemblycall.com. And if you ever want to join the chat mob during our unedited live broadcast or watch those replays and see all the in-between segment banter, then check out our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash assemblycall. I'm Andy Bonhams here with Coach Brian Tonsoni and chat mob Chad Schwarzkopf. I see Jared left the other names in here just to see if I would botch it, if I would Ron Burgundy it, but I did not, so good for me. Uh, all right, so so guys, the big news of today and really the week from an IU perspective is Demise Anderson uh, announcing that he was going to transfer from Indiana today. Uh, I don't know that this comes as a huge shock to, to any of us. I think there'd been some rumblings of that, and I think even just looking at, at what happened to his playing time over the uh, latter part of the season, I, I don't think that part of it uh, is a complete shock. So we'll kind of look at this from a couple angles uh, in, in terms of, you know, what does it mean for IU? What does it mean for Demise? So coach, I'll, I'll throw this to you first. Um, what impact do you really see this having on the roster as it's currently constructed? You know, I, I don't think it has um, much of an impact going into next year. I, I honestly, you know, you don't know where the, the rookies, Geronimo and, and Leo and Galloway, quite fit in compared to Demise, but you would probably guess that there is a conversation that he was going to be 11, 12, or 13 again as a junior with with at least one or two of those freshmen just um, taking taking some minutes because it's Mr. Basketball and, and some of the things that they do well, um, at least allegedly do well, whether they can do it at the college level or not, might be things that Demise struggled with. So uh, it, it just seems to me that this was an honest, um, con- probably an honest conversation between Coach and, and, and Demise on what, you know, his role would have been. And, and you know, they just decided to, to go a different way. And I think it um, – but I don't think it impacts Indiana win, win loss because I'm not sure – unless he made a big jump and then without all the work going on right now uh, and having to do things virtually, uh, I'm not sure that he would have made that leap – um, on his own, uh, without learning some of the, the offense and defensive things that I think that he, the concepts that he needed to do as a player, I think he was okay skill wise, but it was understanding defense, understanding shot selection, those things that are done more in a two on two, three on three, four on four setting in, in a summer that he really needed to gain on, in my opinion. So not much effect at all. In, in my opinion, I do wish him well though. Yeah, I think I think we kind of uh, knew coming into it. Uh, he, he going into last season, uh, we heard in interviews from uh, previous seniors that uh, they were most impressed with uh, what he was going to be able to do uh, this coming year or last last season. And uh, we we saw a little bit in the non conference, but that was against uh, lesser opponents. 
And uh, then from there, it, it just kind of broke down. So obviously, in, in practice, uh, he, some stuff is clicking. And he is showing some skill to a degree. Obviously, where it's lacking the most is in on the actual court and in actual game time situations. And uh, unfortunately, the way the roster is now, uh, like like coach just kind of said, there's too many people in, in line in front of him uh, for him to get enough time that he needs uh, to raise that level in, in game time minutes. And uh, I, I would, again, who knows what the guys coming in are going to do, but their skill set and, and where they were in high school might be slightly on a higher level than Demisi was in high school. So, yes, he's had some time in the program, but um, – it was going to be pretty close or even with some of those guys coming in. So it, it makes sense that he makes the move that he does. And um, we might see some very good things from him when he does find that right team and that right fit. And he does get that play time. We'll, we'll see him uh, move up from there. And uh, uh, that crazy unorthodox shot will start sliding some, some balls through the hoop. Yeah. I think I, I saw it looked like Dustin DePirac had, had talked to him and said, you know, just what, what you guys did, that it was really trying to find a place where he could get consistent playing time. And I think when you looked at who left the roster from IU this year, the fact that, you know, the Devante and Duran graduates, that didn't clear up. The, those guys were not the ones blocking him getting on the floor uh, more than he was. So I think it's, you know, that that's why I guess I wasn't surprised by it. And I don't know that, that most IU fans would have been um, as you look through it that way. So I, so that was there. The, the next question becomes what to do uh, with that scholarship. Uh, and you've got a, a somewhat odd situation. You, you could technically have two if Lander is able to reclassify, which sounds like based on some of the different things the NCAA is going to have to do with people not being able to take um, ACT, SAT, ACT type tests, um, maybe easier for guys to reclassify if they want to. So that maybe only leaves one. Uh, but, but coach, what do you think the, the prudent thing to do is with that scholarship, whether that's a, a, a grad transfer or a regular transfer, whether that's just a bank it because you don't, re- you're not really in a great spot to go and evaluate, be able to really evaluate anybody right now. Uh, put yourself in, in, in Archie's shoes and, and, what would you do with that scholarship? Well, it, it's interesting because one, one personally, I'm not a big grad transfer in unless it's just a dominant. And if it was a dominant person, they'd probably stay where they were at or go pro. Um, I think you do a grad transfer if you have a, a hole in your off in your offense or your lineup. But technically, and I, I I hope there's a change in the starting lineup. But technically, the starting all five starters are coming back, uh, and then you have guys like uh, Race and Jerome. Uh, and Armand that have played and played well. So that now you're at eight and you got three guys coming in that they do need some minutes, uh, regardless, maybe a lot of minutes, maybe some minutes, but you do need to get the three, uh, Leo and Galloway and Geronimo some minutes in their freshman year, especially early in the season. So I would not go a grad, grad transfer. And, and I'm really starting to look at going to start looking at other schools, what they do with their 13 scholarships. I'm not sure you can get 13 four-star and five-star guys on a roster and keep people happy and not have just a crazy revolving, um, you know, door at the transfer level. I'm wondering if, you know, what the right number is. I don't have the answer. And then you fill that 12th and 13th with like some three-star local um, guys that, that might blossom as juniors and sophomores into, you know, that key seventh or eighth guy that are just glad to be at IU uh, that would have gone somewhere else uh, that don't mind coming in, practicing hard and getting very few minutes, but maybe their junior and senior year. I think the days of filling with the best five-star, four-star just creates uh, locker room issues because I think you play your dudes, guys. And, and I, I like an eight-man rotation with the ninth guy and that with 11 guys – you know, 12 guys, that's still two or three guys that aren't playing a lot. And, and that's just the game's different now. Um, so that's my big question, but I would not do anything with it um, unless you had someone that could come in and want a red shirt would be nice uh, to fill that spot or, or where you're at in the next year's class. Um, you know, I got Wesley and Kaufman and those guys. Uh, do you need a, do you need a spot freed up for that? But I wouldn't do anything uh, with it other than uh, have, a, you know, the reclassify. I, th- I think, I think you definitely, uh, for me, I would bank it, uh, especially with the 2021 class that's coming in. The only way I use that is if you have uh, a guy, a Matt Roth, 
ready to hop in that they can they can shoot the three at, at 50 plus percent or very close to it and come in with one year left and uh, already has the experience already has the the groundwork um, just looking for that business MBA and uh, come in grad transfer uh, knock down threes uh, when we need like it Zizloff. And, yeah size loft he had two Zizloff. years to do it but yeah, I'd, I'd like one for less though, because again, that 2021 class is so stacked right. and everything. Um, I, I would push it a lot more should Lander not be able to reclassify. Then it kind of gets a little sketchy. Maybe you want to look for a point guard that has a year or two right. uh, left or so. But I think it, it, we can almost guarantee that Lander's coming uh, the way, like Coach said, things are shaping up. And in that case, again, bank it unless you got a guy that is Reggie Miller, Matt Roth, Jordan Halls that can nail threes like like it's nothing. Yeah, I think that, and I'm at a tough time. I'm at a tough time wanting to win now, and what that roster looks like. And yet, I think Armand Franklin needs minutes next year. I'm going to think Leo needs minutes next year. I think Galloway needs minutes. Why? Because in order to get old and stay old, the guy's got to have minutes. And you can practice all you want, but you need game time. And I like those guys, so let's play those guys as opposed to uh, a one year. Uh, if we have those two scholarships, though, I would be more open to a point guard coming in to give Finnessy some rest. Chad, I think that's a good point. Yeah, I think uh, I think a lot of it would hinge on on Lander. Uh, if you think he's going to be able to reclass, I don't know. You probably bank it, it particularly if uh if Lander uh you know, if if Lander is able to reclassify and you go from there. Um this this is one where you know, from Demizi's standpoint, you're able to see it make sense. So you can see it from his standpoint, you can also see it from the program standpoint. Um so I don't know if you guys can hear me or not. It doesn't seem like you can. We're hang with us. We're trying to get Andy's uh, Wi-Fi um, situation um, back in. We, we've lost Andy's um, audio there for a second. Um, but you know, it's it's just interesting. You know what to do now a days with with that roster with the with the eleventh and twelfth and thirteenth um, sp- spot. You know, and and keep people. Um, you know, and keep people happy. Uh, and, and then it goes back to to what do you want to see on the court. You know, what kind of rotation? I, I really think Indiana struggled when they played 11 at the beginning of the year, and, and they played everyone in the first half. And I think Indiana got better in the second half when he, he limited the, the rotation. Your thoughts, Chad? Yeah, I agree completely. I mean, we, we touted that and we were excited for that going into the season, the, the depth that we had and uh, being able to almost do the uh, oh, Kentucky uh, uh, line changes with, with, our, with our team. Um, but it was, uh, it, it proved to be better once we had a rhythm. Some guys found some chemistry. Uh, we had the right guys coming off the bench. Um, we got a little aggravated with it, obviously, when guys were starting that we didn't think should have. And, and Archie got a little pig headed about his starting lineups. But, um, yeah, I think, I think definitely, in, especially in, uh, the way you see college basketball headed now with, uh, players of higher caliber. Uh, playing on teams and multiple of them, um, you're seeing – it'd be interesting to find stats and see if you could see throughout the years, but it feels like player minutes um, on an individual basis have gone up considerably uh, as as we, as we the years have gone, whereas you might have minutes more spread out amongst those 10 uh, to 12 players. I think now you, you are seeing more teams where you see seven – uh, eight, nine players only seeing the minutes uh, on the on the court, and the way you you want to take risks on players uh, that you're recruiting and everything. You you don't want to scare guys away from coming to your program uh, by uh, having too deep of a roster. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a tough balance to have in this day of age as as a coach. Yeah, you know, you talk about minutes played. You know, you, you look at there. There are eight solid guys coming back um, right now. Um, and how are you going to, de- you know, deliver those minutes? Uh, and, and Devontae Green's minutes, uh, obviously, and Duran's minutes. Uh, De- Devontae has the most minutes, and then Duran had some minutes uh, back. But um, it'll be interesting to see how you do that with the with the twelve guys. Assuming there is a twelve man roster last year, how how do you um, break that up enough to win first? develop players second so while we're um taking over here chad and i are taking over i, I got the uh the recording going myself here um and uh i got the uh soundboard up so when we break for the second uh break maybe i can f- figure that in 
uh, here a little bit tonight. But we also wanted to talk a little bit about Demisi. Uh Chad, your thoughts, uh, where is he going to end up, and at what level do you think that he will go uh, and have um, a solid career? Do you think he's going to want to go somewhere right away where he can play? Um, and I think that's what NAIA, you could go do that, or if you want to go to a Division One, you're going to have to sit out a year. What level do you see, and, and how successful will he be in your opinion? Well, the, the transfer portal is is all up in the air right now. Obviously, uh, NCAA is trying to figure out uh, how they're going to assess those rules. And I think uh, it is in a degree to his benefit um, with having to deal with uh, the coronavirus and everything like that. Uh, I, I believe the NCAA will be a, a little bit more favorable to guys wanting to uh, transfer and uh, uh, what they're going to do with their uh, eligibility and where they're going go to be able to go to. Uh, that being said, Demisi, um he's a high offensive player. He, he's, he struggles on the defense. While this past year we did see his defense improve, um, I think uh, NIA is not, not, a, not a bad choice for him. Um, we'll definitely see some good things there. But, I mean, you get some low-level, uh, lower-level uh, D1 schools, um, a Mac school, maybe part, uh, you could maybe see some time, um, but specific teams without knowing too much about them and, and what they're looking for uh, and, and what they're trying to fill in. I couldn't say specific teams he's going to, um, but it, he could definitely find something to, to do uh, and, and, and put out there. Um, and I, I mean, I, hopefully it's something that we can watch and see and support him to c- continuing on because again, he's a kid that has loved this program and he has loved uh, IU. He loves the teammates. He loves what he's had to do. Again, this is, sounds like it's been a pretty recent within this past month decision that he has made. I mean, we had a couple weeks ago where his, his coach, high school coach, was said that he uh, was committed and going to stay in here and everything like that. And obviously, uh, he, like you said, maybe Coach Miller had a talk with him. Uh, he stated in that Dustin interview that he did that he was talking to some family members and it was weighing in with them. And he wasn't sure where he uh, uh, want, wants, uh, wants to go to, to, to have some success. And so we'll see what he goes. Where do you, what do you think? Where do you see him fitting in, Coach? You know, I, I think you know. I think he can play uh, at a mid-major D one in the MAC. I, I think you know, uh, possibly Missouri Valley type stuff at the high high end. Uh, but c- moving from high school and AAU ball to college it is a different different beast. And and some people can do it and move in quickly, as we saw with TJD, and and others uh, cannot. And and even a guy like Romeo the year before. He was so dominant on the high school and AAU level. When it come into the Big Ten level, there were some things that he had difficulty understanding, um, and, and he's still learning now as you move in from college to the NBA. Uh, that's a big jump. And there's learning curves at every level. And so Demisi was obviously a, 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 a man among boys in high school where the game came real easy to him, and he had the ability to score uh, and use his length. And the game was just too fast for him, it seemed, uh, when I saw him play. And I, I obviously we didn't see him practice. But uh, getting lost defensively, offensively not understanding where to go at times, uh, you could just see that he was trying. The thing I will commend to me is I think he tried. I think he played hard. Uh, but there is a level of IQ and understanding uh, that has to be there for a, a Big Ten basketball player. And I don't think it was because Demise wasn't trying. Um, yeah, his attitude was always his atti- great. Yeah, and it even was when he wasn't playing down the stretch. He was up on the bench, and, and, and so I really think this was a tough decision for him, probably a tough decision for Archie to come to this decision because I think, you know, he said, I never thought I'd be in this situation because uh, he set high goals for himself. And so I think he needs to get to a place where his athleticism can take over a little bit when the understanding or the speed of the, of the conference is just a little bit uh, below um, where the Big Ten is, and, and he'll find a good niche and, and have a good, couple good years after he transfers. So I think this is ultimately in, in his best decision to play basketball, uh, and it, I think it's a good uh, decision because you don't have to worry about a young man who is a good young man not getting playing time. Uh, as, as good as kids can be, it's always tough um, to sit there and practice, 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 and not, not get in, and that can be always be an issue in the locker room. So I, I see him at one, one step below the Big Ten, uh, maybe two steps below, um, and maybe even a smaller uh, conference. Uh, you know, uh, Can he play at East Tennessee State, a good program? Can he go play at Mercer, uh, some of those schools that have had success? Uh, but I think he, he, that level he would be really, really good 
So, um, you know, that that's where I, I see. Andy, do you want, do you want to try see if we can hear you? What do, what do you? Where do you think you see Demisi going and playing? I don't know. Well, who knows if this works? That was uh, – We got you. Computer was lighting up like a Christmas tree with pop-ups. It was really exciting. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I would see I, – hopefully I don't reiterate what you guys just said, but I think – some kind of, you know, more true, kind of more top end mid major type school. Um, I know Jared had some notes in the chat, which you are in the in the run sheet that you know showed those were teams he played well against. I think he just against the caliber of competition that he was facing in the Big Ten or would face in another major league. I just think he's going to struggle to create his own shot in that scenario, and he didn't display well enough that he was a good that he would be super successful as a spot up shooter. So he was just in a difficult spot. Um, when you when you get to that point, but I think you know what what you guys said it, earlier, just about how well he was spoken of by uh, by some of the older guys who left last year and those kinds of things. I think that speaks well to his work ethic and desire to get better. And you know, he thanked the academic advisors and his goodbye thing, and you know, for kind of seeing him as more than a basketball player. So I think he's got a good head on his shoulders, and I and I hope that he is able to you know difficult now to really assess and take visits and do those kinds of things. But hopefully he's able to, uh, you know, hopefully he's able to get some of those visits in and be able to make a good decision where he'll be able to make the most of, of the transfer situation and uh, feel good about his decision, get the playing time that he wants and, uh, and be in good shape from there. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's interesting in this time when there's no, you know, you can't go visit, it's all going to be done virtually and everything you wonder you know, you feel for these kids, even in the NBA draft, that are deciding to test the waters in the NBA draft. It's going to be a, a very unique situation in, in in how do you know for sure. And uh, I don't know if you know for sure. You're just going to have to go on a best feel uh, with that. Uh, I, I think that has some implication, guys, for us recruiting-wise, too, with, with some players that are trying to hold out for even bigger offers, but they can't be seen in AAU and they can't go to campus. So that it, it's just going to be a different beast. And I, I just wish Demisi a whole lot of, um, you know, luck and finding the right place and, and he deserves it. Yep. I would agree. I, I I do think it's, and even as we talked, we're talking about, I don't know how much of what I said even <laughs> was heard, but you know, trying to figure out what to do with other scholarship, like how much can you really evaluate anybody uh, with all this going on? I think it's difficult for both the players and the schools to try to get the right fit. And you hope that it doesn't result in some kind of abnormal amount of transfers or different things like that. Uh, just because you, um, because of what you're just not able to make as informed of a decision as you would normally be able to, um, which is unfortunate, but hopefully, uh, hopefully he's able to make a good decision. So, all right, we'll give this a shot. I'll see if I can close out of this segment and then uh, see if the, the next one can start without a complete disaster. Let's see what happens. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll uh, move to our third segment. We we'll answer your questions there. We've got a few good ones. I have expectations for next season change at all with all the recent player movement. In a uh, random but fun hypothetical. Uh, stick with us next on the assembly call. This is Nick Zeisloft. I never miss an open three, and I never miss an episode of the assembly call. Welcome back to the Assembly Call. I'm Andy Bottoms here with the coach Brian Tonsoni and chat mob Chad Schwartzkopf. And remember, you need to be subscribed to our email newsletter. We send out a weekly IU news roundup even during the offseason. And after every game, we send out a detailed postgame analysis. Just text IU to 66866 or go to assemblycall.com. That's IU to 66866 or go to assemblycall.com. It's now time for our mailbag. As always, all questions were submitted via our private IU basketball discussion community, which you can find out more about at assemblycall.com slash community. And the first question comes from Justin. What are reasonable expectations for next season? I'm hoping for a top four finish in the Big Ten. Is this expecting too much? Coach, what do you think about uh, top four finish in the Big Ten next season? No, Justin, I, I would say it, it's not bad to try to expect a top four. That would be something that is the next step. Uh, but the Big Ten, as tough as it was, you had teams like, you know, Michigan and Rutgers who had really, you know, good years be eight and nine seeds uh, in the Big Ten tournament. Uh, if the Big Ten is as tough, um, and a lot of the preseason projections say that it's looking like, again, another nine teams in, um, I so I, I think they're going to be in that discussion for a top four. But I, I think anywhere from four to seven 
um, would be acceptable depending on competition and scheduling and stuff. Yeah, yeah I'm, right, I'm right. I'm right there with coach. I agree. I mean, there's not a lot uh, that many play, many teams are losing this year uh, going into next year. And those that are kind of adding some other stuff that might help them out or, or current talent is getting better. So I, I think that's, a, that's kind of the good window. Again, a, a strong big 10 is a good thing for IU. So um, while four would be fantastic and everything like that, I'm not going to be terribly disappointed if it lands more in the six, seven, because that just means the big 10 is looking pretty good. Yeah. I think and quickly, Andy, yeah. Uh, you know, bracketology wise too, Michigan and Ohio state were what seven and eight in the big 10, but they were going to be six or seven seeds. And, and I, I really think that's more where, you know, if you're a six or seven seed for Indiana, you're pushing the top 25. That's a nice spot for the fourth year. Uh, well, in my opinion. And the place in the league gets dif- difficult with the unbalanced schedules and different things like that. I, I think, I think top four feels maybe slightly aggressive to me, but I think anywhere in the, and, and maybe this is splitting hairs cause I'm only going to give you a one or two, two spots different, but I think in the five, six range, maybe as you look at who's coming back, but you've still got a lot of draft decisions that could impact those. I mean, Illinois could be swung pretty wildly in a couple different directions, depending upon what Kofi Coburn and, and IO end up doing. So, uh, I, who knows? I don't think that's expecting too much though. Um, I think everybody's expecting some kind of trajectory and a, a build up to that. So I don't know that it's outlandish it might be a little bit higher than what I might expect, but I think still reasonable. Uh, all right. So this one, um, this just says, you told me to ask this again last week. So um, I don't know who this is from, but sorry about that. Uh, the assembly call crew, Jared, Andy, Ryan, coach, and one current IU player plays pickup against a hybrid Crimson Cast Hoosier Hysterics team plus TJD. Which other current player are you picking to round out your team and who wins? So, Chad, I'll, I'll throw this one to you uh, to you first. Who who do you think we would need to uh, to help us in this scenario? Well, uh, first I got to say, where do I come in? I guess I guess I'm kind of the Will Sheehy of the assembly call coming off the bench, ready ready to chime in as I kind of always do for this show. I have a feeling um, a number of starters are ripe for injury, so you should probably be at the ready. <laughs> I guess we do. We've got the depth. We've got the depth that they don't have. Um, I don't know. I mean, you throwing in Trace Jackson Davis on their team, that's tough. You've, you've got to have something that can neutralize him. Um, they've got maybe a little bit more – they're a little more wiry. Uh, but I think uh, the the assembly call squad is going to be a little bit more physical of a team. So maybe I, I uh, keep that physicality and maybe give him Joey. Cause Joey has maybe a little insight against Trace Jackson Davis playing against him in the uh, in practices. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's where I would go with it. Coach, what about you? What do we need? We we need race. You know, we need race for two reasons. One, because TJD, you got to have someone. I I could try, but I would totally get blown away by TJD. I tried to sit on that left shoulder. He just jumped right over me, dunk, and call me baldy on the way back down the court. So I don't want none of that. We need race in there. And then, because we just really need to have Scott, you know, like, you know, pee his pants. And we'll just send race running right at him. And then he'll freak (laughs) out like he does on Crimson Cast when he gets all crazy. And and then the game would be over. It would be ours. So, So race will have to be the guy. Yeah, I would. I was. Those are the two guys I was down to for the same reasons. Just you need somebody to be able to help you guard Trace. I, my, I'm a little bit concerned that Ryan would be too distracted if Race was on the team, where he might be kind True. of like running up to him, trying to do a lot of hugging of him during the game, which could be problematic. <laughs> so that leads me to Throw maybe a shot off. Maybe maybe side with Chad to go with Joey. He's actually worked out with Trace a lot, so maybe he's in the good position. I don't know. I, I think Race was would have been my first pick, but the the Ryan angle uh, kind of threw me a little bit. So. Uh, all right. We'll do, I we'll, just say, just just gotta just gotta watch out because uh, those Hoosier hysterics like to take those charges. So they're, they're the Wisconsin players on the team. So watch true. those guys. True. That's that. Uh, that's definitely the mo. Uh, all right. So one one last quick one. Uh, we'll fit in here. Given current roster and commitments, what types of players does IU need to recruit for twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two? Not names per se, rather position, skill sets, uh, potential leave early stars versus development players, etc. So, coach, I'll throw that one to you first. You can, we talk about it for years. You can never get enough shooting. Uh, and, and I think you also need to keep pursuing bigs. We have uh, the Duncham kid coming, but we have a couple bigs leaving, probably TJD and Joey, and, and then Race will be a senior. So you're going to have to go after bigs. And, and I really would like to start seeing bigs that can stretch the floor. Um, you know, a lot of bigs, fours and fives. You look at Wisconsin, fours and fives, they can hit the three. Let's be that multiple-dimensional multiple, multiple dimensional type of team. But we need shooting at every position. But bigs, fours and fives, and then uh, obviously uh, the guards that can fill it up. Chad, what about you? 
Yeah, I'm going to echo the same, uh, especially with the emphasis on the bigs, like you said. And I'll even throw a name, Trey Kaufman. You, we got to get him. Uh, TJD is going to be gone. Uh, get him to fill in there. You have him for possibly those two years uh, that he stated. And then um, shooting, I think some guys that we have might develop, but uh, those big guys are my priority in that. Yeah, I would uh, I would echo what you guys said. So for the in the interest of time, we'll uh, we'll leave it at that. Um, but, but agreed, those are some things that you'd like to see. And, and with the shooting, we'd like to see how that might evolve what the team's able to do, uh, offensively as you go through that way. So, uh, with that, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, close up this week's episode of the assembly call. If you want to see us do the show live, join us at assemblycall.com on Thursday nights for the live broadcast of our assembly call radio recording. And don't forget to go to assemblycall.com or text IU to 66866 to join our free email newsletter. Special thanks to Bob Thompson for producing most of the music you hear on the show. And thank you for listening. We'll talk to you again next Thursday night. Until then, keep your elbows in and your eyes on the rim and go Hoosiers. Thank everybody for coming out. All right. I got to get out of here, folks. Thank you. All right. So the only other question that we had uh, was one from Jim Tom Hoosier. In your opinion, what do the next eight months look like for IU athletics? There's a question we probably could do a whole podcast on, although we based largely on speculation. So we'll uh, save the speculation for <laughs> AC after dark. Apparently, I, I mean, what what do you guys think about that? It's it's pretty tough to say at this point. But uh, any initial thoughts based on things you've heard, things you believe? One, I'll throw out the positive right away. I, I think. Big crowds are always going to be the last thing that come back um, in society, and that that just scares me for football and and even basketball to some extent, um, because I just believe this thing is is real, and and the confidence of people getting out um, will will be the big big thing. Uh, we all want to get out, but do you really have the confidence to go, uh, you know, sit in section 11 with, you know, 200 people around you uh, with the variety of, of, of struggle that this thing is. But I also believe that, that our country is, is great. Uh, we have, you know, great resources. We have great people that um, I think the first thing would be a, a remedy, uh, something that is used on a regular basis in the hospital to treat the very serious cases when people get to the hospital that will relax a lot of us, um, you know, whether it's a, a certain drug or a certain treatment. I, I, I believe in America to come up with that in the next two or three months. I think that would be a, a big step to getting uh, things back to normal because this thing's not going away. It's just a matter of how we're going to handle it and treat it so that we don't you know, have a big, big rush anymore uh, until we get a vaccine. And that vaccine is a while back. But I, I don't want sports to be gone until we get a vaccine because you're looking at fall of 2021 before things get going. And that, that's just going to be tough for a lot of us. But um, I, I just believe in America and, and I believe in its ingenuity uh, to, to solve major problems. And I know there's some time constraints with uh, regulations and testing controls and all make sure it doesn't have side effects and all those things. But I, I just believe that, um, you know, delay is where I think we'll be at. I think there'll be a delayed football season and maybe a delayed basketball season, but I think sports come back in 2020 in some way, uh, maybe towards the end of November, December is more likely when, when things, there's a handle on stuff. And I hope that's not wishful thinking. I hope I'm not looking through it in rose colored glasses. I want everyone to be healthy, not just myself. And uh, I'd go to a sporting event tomorrow if it opened up and, and I knew I could be safe. So, um, but, but that's what I think. And I think, I think we're in good hands. Uh, I think the Dolson uh, choice is really important now that uh, it is just a handover of someone who's been in there, knows the coaches, knows the people, knows the lay of the land, not coming in trying to figure out new things uh, in order to survive this. Uh, but there are going to be some tough decisions, uh, some cuts budget-wise, some salary cuts, some personnel cuts inside the athletic department and, and the university probably. Um, so it's going to look different. Uh, but I'm going to hang in there and have a lot of faith in America, have a lot of faith in Scott Dolson and Indiana to do the right things. And, and then we'll get we'll get through this um, – uh, eventually. I, I feel like college sports in particular, even more so than pros, uh, when you're a college athlete, you're very contained within your team. You're very contained within the environment that you're with, you're in. Um, I think we will see some of those sports come back. 
Um, maybe not with audiences. It's going to be a, a very surreal uh, experience because we may see some football games happen before then uh, with empty stadiums, definitely. And um, I think since the teams stay together and uh, you'll see testing uh, broadening out amongst them and uh, staying within their own communities and everything like that, kind of self-quarantining um, in a way amongst their own teams and, and with each other. Obviously, that's a little bit more difficult with football because you've got a lot more players and a lot more people to organize. Uh, it's a little simpler when it comes to basketball. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, with just common sense, um, everyday hygiene and, and, uh, uh, measures that we are currently doing now can be applied, uh, on a, on a scale to, uh, some athletics and, uh, we will continue to learn new things. And as, as time goes on, and, uh, like you said, we're, we're ingenuity, uh, that this country has and everything, we'll, we'll get it figured out and we'll, uh, We'll look back at it as uh, as hopefully just a dark time, and and that we we got closer and and got through it. One, one thing, yeah, one I, thing I, I'm looking at, yeah. fellas. Yeah. I'm sorry, Andy. One thing I'm looking at is is these contained spaces. You know, the meat packing place, the jails, the cruise ships. How how do those things? turn it around and not spread so fast because you know a andy will test to this with his wife we go to school and we have 400 500 kids that are just germ centered uh carriers every year and you get the flu and, and things like that and you want them to be safe and the people who are teaching them are older people jen not so much as brian um but you do worry about that being in an enclosed places your your factories your subarus your uh here you know the the factories in our location that have had to shut down, how can they get back to work safe in an enclosed environment? And when you see how that is handled, that's going to be the ticket for sports um, with fans. I, I do see a lot of chatter in, in the chat mob about no fans. I think that's ultimately what we'll do early, but man, that's not sports either. You know, it's better than nothing to watch on TV, but it's going to be really interesting to me. All the words and all the protests and all the stuff that's going on, it's noise. I'm watching how do contained places deal with this because that's going to be how work comes back and that's going to be how entertainment comes back um, and, and how fast, in my opinion. Yeah, I think some of that stuff is just and, – and every, every job is different. I mean, I've been able to work from home. It, it's definitely um, – expedited the the path to allowing people to work from home but i also think that, that a lot of people have been able to see that it's for as much as some employers kind of feared what it would be and are people going to be still doing what they're supposed to be doing i think in some places it's calmed some of those fears to a point where i don't know that there's a need to to rush back to office buildings and different stuff like that schools is a little bit is a little bit harder i mean as you said there's a lot of different factors um there and i think you know, a lot of, a lot of teachers would probably attest to, you know, they're a lot more effective when they can be in front of somebody and have those face-to-face -face connections and talk through that. And there's an element to be had with that. Not that you can't teach remotely, but I think it's a different, uh, it's a different animal. So yeah, it's just trying to figure out how you do that, how you get testing to a point where, um, where you're able to feel comfortable with, with knowing uh, what's going on and then you can take action appropriately. I think now it's, you don't have that. So you're, kind of making every decision blind and you've, you've got to factor it in for the well, way you don't have to based on how some people are handling it. But um, y your inclination is to, to plan for the worst case scenario and, and assume that every, you know, everything uh, you're doing needs to be really ratcheted up. So I think that becomes difficult. And yeah, anything is you look at these phase rollouts, I mean, anything like sports concerts, different stuff like that um, is going to get pushed toward the, you know, toward the bottom of the list because it's really hard to do. And I think it was, I think it was Kyle Nedenrip who had the story um, about one of the sectionals in Indianapolis and that, you know, people got infected there. I mean, you see, again, people don't know for sure that that's where they contracted it because it was a bunch of people who had also been around um, different things like that. But you can see in some of these scenarios, even in smaller venues than what we'd be talking about having some of these other basketball games and other things, you, you know, it doesn't take too many stories like that before you feel like, yeah, I better, you know, it, there's a liability component to the the people opening that to the school to the you know to the team to the all those kinds of things that you've got to figure out so yeah i would i would think whatever it's going to be even if it's it things are delayed a little bit i think the number of fans is going to be extremely limited if not zero uh at the beginning and 
that'll be a different experience. Although probably a lot of us clamoring for sports to watch would, uh, would, would probably take it as opposed to nothing. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's going to be make for some surreal things, uh, to watch and, um, maybe a good, uh, control test of, of what home field advantage really means and, and different things like that. I think, I think with, with no fans, it, it just, it, it gives a good morale boost for everyone though, too, just to, just to kind of see the sports happening. Um, even again, like with no fans it is, is going to be a, a good thing for people to see and to feel, uh, have that sense of normalcy, uh, uh, for a moment. You know, Chad, you bring up a great point because for sports for us, it, it, it is our outlet. And some people may find that silly and, and it's not as important as other things, but some people have working on their cars in their garages. They can still do that. Some people have hunting and, and, and some things in gardening that they do and they're really into. Some people have painting and art, but we have sports and, and it is, and, and we are a society that loves sports and it is an outlet and it has been difficult. And, and I, I used, at first I was a little bit like, oh, come on, don't feel so sorry for yourself. It's just sports. But no, that any outlet um, that people have is important to get away from the natural stresses stresses of your day, uh, and it is important. And we, we lost a Hall of Fame uh, basketball coach to COVID today, Ed Siegel, or yesterday, who coached at Pike. Uh, I had the opportunity to do some of my pre-teaching service hours with him 27 years ago uh, and had conversations with him. He was very well known, uh, the athletic director at North Central that uh, Andy was referring to and that but there's five people who died from attending that one sectional and 12 other people uh, that I know. Uh, I know those coaches. I, I know the videographer was uh, his son played AAU with mine that, that does some video work for athletes. And he, he was mentioned in that article. Um, my brother-in-law's um, athletic director was, uh, was in ICU uh, with the ventilator. Um, you know, there was a high school coach at Indianapolis Heron that uh, was uh, in his uh, 40s. I believe, um, and came down with no previous symptoms. I and mean, when you're talking a 53 year old guy that's in gyms all the time and, and in schools and, and that, it, it starts hitting home. And boy, I want this thing to turn around tomorrow in a heartbeat. But, um, I, you know, I've been very, very, very careful um, for me personally, but not to be selfish. I have an 80 some year old mom. I haven't been able to see her, and I, I want to go see her. Uh, and I don't want to carry it to, to anybody else. So it, it is. Um, it is one of the toughest things I've had to deal with, um, but um, I, I do believe that we will um, get somewhere. I tell you what, that June 11th golf, if someone on television doesn't open open up television with that opening tee box at 6.45 in the morning, I don't care if it's the worst PGA golfer in the world, I am tuning in for 18 hours, and I'm betting the crap out of that event. <laughs> you got, you got uh, Brady or Peyton? <laughs> That, well, that one too, but I'm talking about the PGA opens up uh, June 11th. The actual PGA yeah, that's what they said no they were fans. going to. So, gonna you know, and look at the 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 last dance, six some million people or whatever the rating, probably more than that. But the the ratings that they had, and then the the draft, people are just thirsty for it. Um, so it'll, it'll be interesting to see how we get there. Yep. So, well, hopefully, hopefully sooner than later. For virtual sure. tailgating in the fall is going to suck. <laughs> yes, that's true. That that's is better true. than none. I mean, yeah, I, I would agree. I would agree. Oh, well, all right. Anything else you guys got? I think we hit all the, all the questions. I was texting Jared about the audio issues. So I think he's going to be able to pull the, the other audio off of YouTube. And I sent him the good, segments for one and three audio files so coach i don't know that you need to send him yours i'll just save it for the time being in case it, okay he would need it but I'll, i have uh, it if he needs it i'll just let him know. know i have it i will okay. definitely i will definitely do that so all right well everybody enjoy uh the rest of their evening the rest of the draft and uh we'll be back fun, some would say <laughs> some would say Man. some would say good chunks of it were fun but nah don't be popping those drops of yourself, man. It's bad enough when it when. No, that wasn't me. That was Chad. Chad has. Oh, that, that was Chad. Was, that oh, was Chad not me. My my, I have a I have a refresh with hardly any of the new ones, and so I yeah I don't all even right. have them. But I definitely wouldn't be playing one of myself. So don't worry about that. That definitely. I'll chase her all the way from Assembly Hall to uh, Switchyard. <laughs> oh jeez. I gotta I, I, I gotta be able to I gotta be able to get him back. None of us yeah. have it to get him back. Uh, this is true. This is true. 
This is true. Well, well, Chad, thank you uh, very much for hopping in and and joining us. We set you up on the night when there's almost nothing to talk about. It had not been for the transfer. So always a fun time to come on when it's like, oh, yeah, why don't you come on with us and talk about, well, not, not really sure. The other times that Jared has had me host was you guys were at the Purdue game and Knight decided to come back. So I spent a lot of that game drafting my banner moment because it needed a little bit more weight. And then you yeah. gave me, I had senior night as well, which obviously needs a little bit more weight. So that's all right. I've been thrown in the deep end a little bit by him. <laughs> well, this, yeah. So then by, uh, yeah, by comparison, this was, this was yeah, a walk no in the deal. park. So yeah, yeah, perfect. All right, cool. All right. Thanks everybody. Uh, thanks, guys. thanks for, thanks for tuning in. Everybody stay safe and, uh, yep. We'll Tell talk Jen to hang in there with the uh, teaching stuff. Right. Yeah, we'll we'll do. You do the same. It's uh, it's definitely been a it's definitely been a challenge. She's really embraced it, but I think there's parts of it that she really finds frustrating and just trying to get a hold of some of the kids. But I think when she's actually like interacting with the kids, it's super cool just to hear her up the stairs from afar. So that's the number one thing you said. It well is like I can handle this and and I can figure out how to get assignments and do that, but it's just not the same. And I yep. hope the kids have a better appreciation. The teachers have a better appreciate parents, all of that about how it is the day to day motivation, butt kicking, all the things that we do that really matters more so than the assignments. So yeah. hopefully that comes out. But, um, I, I do appreciate her with the little ones, man. I, I, it's okay with my high school kids. I pop into a Zoom meeting. Hey, what are you doing? Get your work in. Don't be stupid. See it. You know, <laughs> with the elementary kids. The elementary kids need a little more loving and hugging and all of that. And that's well, a, a little bit. And I think you know what she's trying to do is everybody. She doesn't like when everybody says the, oh, I'm homeschooling. I'm doing whatever. She goes, you know, we should still be providing the instruction. There shouldn't be you know, if they're watching the videos that she's, you know, doing of herself and then, you know, the, the work that goes along with it, if they do all that stuff in the right order, it should hopefully not put a lot of burden on the, on the parents. Right. I think that's the challenge with, with ones that age. It's like, you don't want the parent to feel like they truly have to teach because, but they are less self-sufficient. So trying to figure out what the appropriate level of, uh, of detail is and, you know, trying to, you know, trying to give that to them so that it's not falling back on the parents, but she's got some parents that are still working and doing different stuff. And so she's having some of the meetings with the kids who can't get together until the evening and the evening and whatever else. So just proving further that she's a much better person than I am. And uh, <laughs> not that there needed to be any proof of that, but you know, no. so she's a good one. All right. So, all right. Well, you guys take care and uh, take care, Chad. All, all right. right. Nice guys. Thank you. All right. See you guys.